With a quick round of googling, I found these three claims. Kim ong Young with 210 IQ, Albert Einstein with 215 IQ, and Terence Tao with 225 IQ. These are just three people out of many that people claim to have over 200 IQ. However, I'm going to make the claim that all of these scores are completely fake. Don't get me wrong, these people are really intelligent, but according to the definition of IQ, there just can't be this many people with 200 IQ. Let's start with the basics. What even is IQ? IQ is an abbreviation for intelligence quotient, and there are two different ways to define IQ. We have the old outdated method that I will call classical IQ, and the modern method that I will call modern IQ. Also keep in mind that we can't really compare the two methods. If you have a classical IQ of 121, that does not mean that you have a modern IQ of 121 as well. Classical IQ. The first classical IQ test was created in the early 1900s as a method to determine which school children were mentally slow. These children that were considered mentally slow were placed in special education programs where they could learn at their own pace. This IQ test was called the Binet-Simon test and it had 30 problems to solve. These 30 problems are supposed to reflect how mentally developed you are. And now I'm going to take one of these problems and test you. I will show you three pairs of faces and in each pair of faces you have to determine which face is more beautiful. You have 10 seconds, good luck. I think phase 1 to 1 is most beautiful, but I don't really know if everyone will agree. So the tests have 30 of these problems to solve that reflect mental development. If you take the test now, all you get is a score, let's say 27 out of 30 correct. But this score is meaningless without the data to compare it to how well other people did on the test. To get this data, Binet and Simon gave this test to children of different grades. I don't know how many children they actually gave the test to, but let's say they gave it to 100 children of each grade. The average score for first graders was 10 correct out of 30. For second graders, it was 13 correct out of 30, and so on. Now that we have this data, we can start with the real testing. Our first subject is a 4th grader that scored 19 out of 30. This corresponds to the average score of the 5th graders, meaning that they would have the mental age of a 5th grader, while the chronological age of a 4th grader. Our second subject is a 5th grader that scores 15 out of 30. They have the mental development of the average student in 3rd grade. Binet and Simon would consider this child as mentally slow, so any student that scored two grades lower than the real grade was considered mentally slow. A couple of years after this test was made, someone came up with the first definition of IQ. Classical IQ is defined as mental age divided by chronological age multiplied by 100. The first subject was a fourth grader with the mental age of a fifth grader. If we assume that 5th graders are 9 years old and 4th graders are 8 years old, then their classical IQ would be 112.5. The second subject was a 5th grader with the mental age of a 3rd grader, so a 9 year old with the mental age of a 7 year old, their IQ would be roughly 77.8. The thing is, with this definition of IQ, it is kind of easy to get 200 IQ. If a first grader scores 21 questions correct, then their IQ would be 10 divided by 5 multiplied by 100, so 200 IQ. With classical IQ, it is 100% possible to get a score of 200 IQ. However, classical IQ is bad and outdated. So when we say IQ in a modern context, we don't talk about classical IQ, we talk about modern IQ. Modern IQ is a method to try to compare the intelligence of people in the same age group. 
mostly it's used for adults, so the age group between 18 and 65. As an example, let's say we have a test with 30 intelligence problems, and we give it to 1000 randomly selected people between 18 and 65. These 1000 people is what we call a sample in statistics. This sample is supposed to reflect the entire population. Out of the 1000 people, 20 answered 30 out of 30 correct, so 2% of the sample. 30 people scored 29 out of 30, 50 people scored 28 out of 30, and so on. If you score 30 out of 30, you're in the top 2% meaning that you scored higher than 98% of the population. If you scored 29 out of 30, you would be in the top 5%, scoring higher than 95% of the population. And if you score 25 out of 30, you would be in the top 30%, scoring higher than 70% of the population. So how do we go from this data to IQ? We have to map how well people did on the test compared to each other, onto a statistical distribution called the normal or Gaussian distribution. The curve itself for IQ is described by this mathematical function. It is quite complex and we don't really need it for our purpose, so we can just ignore it. Also, the height of the curve doesn't really matter. The height does not describe probability. It is the area under the curve that describes probability. For example, in the interval from 100 to 115 IQ, the area under the curve is 0 0.3413, equivalent to 34.13%. This percentage has two meanings. The first meaning is that 34.13% of the population taking the test should be between 100 and 115 IQ. The second meaning is that a randomly selected person taking the test has a 34.13% probability of scoring between 100 and 115 IQ. Also, keep in mind that this is how IQ is defined. The data is mapped in such a way that 34.13% of the population is always between 100 and 115 IQ. The total area under the curve is 1 or 100%. Just to clarify, this is the area under the curve from minus infinity to positive infinity. 50% of people will have above 100 IQ and 50% will have below 100 IQ. If we move this line to 115 IQ, we have 84.13% of people below 115 IQ and 15.87% of people above 115 IQ. If we move the line to 131 IQ, we will have 98% of the population below and 2% of the population above. Now, I want you to look at the raw data. The top 2% of the sample scored 30 out of 30. So we assume that the top 2% of the entire population will score 30 out of 30. The top 2% in terms of IQ is 131 or more IQ. This is roughly how the mapping is done from raw data to IQ. Now, imagine that we keep moving that line all the way to 200 IQ. 99.9999999986916% of the population will have below 200 IQ, while 0 0.0000000013084% will have above 200 IQ. But how low is this number? If you take the inverse of the number, you will get 76.4 billion. This means that we expect one human out of every 76.4 billion humans to have at least 200 IQ. This insane amount of humans is roughly 10 times more than the human population. This is why I can say with confidence that no human alive has at least 200 IQ. To go one step further, we can calculate the probability of there being no human alive with at least 200 IQ. To explain how I'm going to do this, imagine that we're flipping a coin. Flipping it once gives a 50% probability of heads and 50% probability of tails. Flipping it twice gives a 25% probability of two heads, 50% probability of one head and one tails, and 25% probability of two tails. 
And then for three flips, it's something like this. Now we want to find the probability of getting at least one tails after n flips. To do this, you have to ask yourself, what is the probability of not flipping at least one tail? I mean, if we don't flip at least one tail, then we flip zero tails. So the probability of not flipping at least one tail is the probability of flipping zero tails. If we flip zero tails, then we flip only heads. So it's also the same as only flipping heads. The probability of getting only heads is one over two raised to the n, where n is the amount of flips. The probability of flipping at least one tails is equal to one minus the probability of getting only heads. For one flip, the probability is a half. For two, it's 75%. For three, it's 87.5% and so on. Now imagine that this wasn't a coin toss at all. Instead, we are randomly selecting humans and they have a 50% probability of being male or female. We determined the probability of picking at least one male. If we picked one human, it was 50%. If we picked two humans, it was 75%. If we picked three humans, it was 87.5% and so on. Now again, imagine that we never had this in the first place. Instead, we had people with under 200 IQ and people above 200 IQ. We don't have a 50-50 anymore. We have these insane probabilities, but the exact same logic holds. By picking one random human, we have one minus the probability of not having 200 IQ raised to the first, equaling this number. By picking two humans, the probability of at least one having 200 IQ is equal to one minus the probability of having under 200 IQ raised to the second, equaling this number. For three humans, we have the exact same. We have one minus the probability of having under 200 IQ raised to the power of three, equaling this number. And now for 7.9 billion people, we have that the probability of at least one having 200 IQ is equal to one minus the probability of having under 200 IQ raised to the power of 7.9 billion equaling 0 0.0982, meaning that there is a 9.82% probability that there is at least one person alive with at least 200 IQ and a 90.18% probability that everyone alive has below 200 IQ. I think this probability is high enough to state with confidence that no person alive has above 200 IQ. But what about every single person that has ever lived? It is estimated that there has been 107 billion people in existence. And remember that we were expecting one person out of every 76.4 billion people to have at least 200 IQ. Meaning that we would expect at least one person to have at least 200 IQ. Also, if we do the probability calculations, so the probability of there being at least one person that has ever lived with at least 200 IQ, we have one minus the probability of having below 200 IQ raised to the power of 107 billion. This equals 0 0.7534, a 75.34% probability that at least one human that has ever existed has had at least 200 IQ. I was actually surprised by how low this number was, only a 75% probability. That means that there is a good chance, a 25% probability, that there has never been a single human with at least 200 IQ. To summarize the video, classical IQ can have people with above 200 IQ. However, because classical IQ is more about mental development of children and not intelligence, it has been thrown away as a method in modern times. Any classical IQ should not be taken seriously. For modern IQ, a score of 200 IQ is possible, however, it is very unlikely. There is only a 9.82% probability that anyone alive has at least 200 IQ. Therefore, we can state with confidence that no human alive has at least 200 IQ. That was everything for this video. Bye bye.
Thank you.